Since 1925, 4,000 laboratory-associated infections have endangered the health of laboratory workers. The majority of these cases occurred in people engaged in research or clinical diagnostic work. The people involved were primarily trained laboratory professionals. 80% of the hazards investigated resulted from unknown causes. However, droplet nuclei and large droplet aerosols created during laboratory procedures have been recognized as principal sources of contamination. Whether a laboratory worker becomes infected depends on several factors. These include the extent of contamination, route of infection, virulence of the organism, and host susceptibility. The problem is compounded by the unnecessary generation of aerosols when common laboratory tools, the inoculating loop, pipette, syringe and needle, are used incorrectly. Procedures requiring a blender or centrifuge may result in the production of infectious aerosols and contamination of working surfaces. Using a properly maintained blender, centrifuge, and biological safety cabinet will minimize infection. In this presentation, we will explore how to properly use and maintain these pieces of equipment. Animal studies play a major role in some areas of microbiology, such as mycology and virology. Often in these studies, animals must be necropsied and the microbial populations in organs quantified. These procedures may result in the production of infectious aerosols. Animal organs must often be homogenized. The risks during homogenization may be minimized by proper use of the high-speed blender. A household blender should not be used to homogenize tissue. The loose cover will release many droplet nuclei aerosols into the air. This is an unnecessary danger because aerosol-free blenders are available. A properly functioning aerosol-free blender gives excellent protection from infectious aerosols. But bearings in the cutting blade shaft should be regularly inspected and replaced when worn. Always inspect the O-ring seal or rubber gasket. A damaged gasket permits aerosols to be released. The aerosol-free blender is equipped with a closed drainage system to drain the contents. When you bypass this closed system and immediately remove the cover, an aerosol is released. Remember, violent agitation generated by the cutting blades causes aerosols which remain suspended within the blender for over an hour after it has stopped. Precautions must also be taken when working with a centrifuge. You can minimize the likelihood of droplet nuclei being released from broken tubes by doing the following. First, inspect each tube to be used. Be certain there are no chips or cracks. Now, inspect the carriers in the centrifuge head. Be sure carriers are clean and that mountings are secure. Then, balance specimens on opposite sides of the centrifuge head. Balancing will reduce vibration and stress, thus minimizing the possibility of breakage. Cap and seal each safety carrier carefully. Finally, replace the centrifuge cover and make sure that it is secure. 
we have used a bucket type centrifuge with safety carriers to demonstrate these procedures. Before beginning work with an angle head centrifuge, first inspect each tube for defects as previously demonstrated. Do not fill tubes to the top because the contents will spill when the tubes are placed at an angle in the centrifuge. You must also balance paired carriers and seal each carrier. The last step is to securely close the centrifuge cover. As you see, the same step-by-step -step procedure is followed with the bucket type and the angle head centrifuge. The only exception is in limiting tube contents to prevent spillage in the angle head centrifuge. Under certain conditions, aerosols may escape from a tube during high-speed rotation. The most dangerous situation occurs when a tube shatters in the centrifuge shield. Released microorganisms have been detected up to 12 or more feet from the centrifuge. We have examined the formation of droplet nuclei in procedures performed with common laboratory equipment. Some procedures generate large droplets, larger than five microns. These particles are airborne for a short time and then settle on the skin and bench tops. These large droplets usually cannot penetrate beyond the tracheobronchial tree. Surface contamination can result from separating the halves of a petri dish. A moisture film may form between two contact points. When the film is broken, aerosol droplets develop. Contamination can also result from the surface film breaking when screw-top tubes are opened. Additionally, surface contamination may result when supernatants are decanted. This happens when a solution is poured into another container and large aerosol droplets form. As we have seen, large droplets may settle on any surface in the laboratory. Remember, droplet nuclei, which are smaller, may drift over considerable distances. They may then settle out and contaminate surfaces. Aerosols cannot always be eliminated, but their effects can be minimized through use of a biological safety cabinet. The biological safety cabinet, when used in conjunction with good microbiological technique, provides a safe environment for the laboratory worker. This negative pressure, or class one unit, is one type of safety cabinet. Another type of safety cabinet is the laminar flow, or class two cabinet. The negative pressure cabinet is usually four to six feet wide. A glass plate is located between the laboratorian and the work. The cabinet is equipped with an access opening through which most items may be placed in the working area. Larger items can be introduced by raising the hinged glass plate. Air is drawn through the front opening by a blower at a velocity of 75 linear feet per minute. The effluent air from the cabinet must be decontaminated to protect people downstream. In this model, high efficiency particulate air filters called HEPA filters are located above the work area. They are designed to retain 99.99% of particles three-tenths of a micron in diameter. As an additional safeguard, an ultraviolet light is mounted above the HEPA filter. The ultraviolet source provides lethal radiation for any particulate matter escaping the HEPA filters. Room air is drawn through the front opening of the cabinet. The air moves with such velocity that dust-borne microorganisms are unlikely to contaminate the culture media in use. 
the microbiologist should handle both media and equipment so as to minimize introducing contaminants into the media. Always place a towel soaked in disinfectant over the immediate work area. This will reduce aerosols created by splatters. Open flasks or test tubes should be held at a 45 degree angle with the open end facing inward. This avoids directing unwanted microbes into the culture medium. When opening a Petri dish, the cover should be tilted back toward the operator. This serves as a protective shield, further reducing the possibility of contaminating the culture medium. The laminar flow cabinet and negative pressure cabinet are similar in dimension and construction. The laminar flow cabinet recirculates 80 to 90 percent of its air through HEPA filters. The result is a cleaner working area for the microbiologist. For this reason, the blower must be turned on at least five minutes before work is begun. This will establish the air barrier and purge the working area. The 10 to 20 percent of air drawn into the front provides an air barrier. This barrier limits the number of room contaminants reaching the work area and virtually eliminates the movement of pathogens back into the room. Air drawn into the front opening of the laminar flow cabinet is equal in volume to that exhausted. The exhausted air goes through HEPA filters prior to discharge into the room or an exhaust duct. Ideally, however, the cabinet exhaust air should not be recirculated. To ensure protective functioning of the laminar flow cabinet, place equipment and supplies in the cabinet before beginning work. Make sure that intake and exhaust grills are not covered. Even when working in a cabinet, you should practice aseptic techniques. Since much of the air is recirculated, heat can build up. For this reason, use open flames as little as possible. Several recommendations apply to both negative pressure and laminar flow cabinets. Before using any safety cabinet, become thoroughly familiar with the operator's manual. Wear protective clothing and maintain a clean working environment. Next, position the glass partition between you and the working area. Be sure the blower is on and working before using the cabinet. Perform all work well inside the cabinet area. When work in the cabinet is completed, clean and decontaminate all exposed surfaces. Be certain that the ultraviolet light is turned on at all times except while you are working in the cabinet. Each ultraviolet light bulb should be periodically cleaned and checked for efficiency. A final word of caution. Never use a safety cabinet as a substitute for a chemical fume hood. Infectious hazards may be minimized by using safe laboratory procedures. These procedures include proper handling of common laboratory tools, attention to detail in operating laboratory equipment, and proper use of biological safety cabinets. <laughs>